I bring you holiday greetings from the Colonial Dames of America and a warm welcome to She Rode on a Wheel. Greetings from the archives of our first 10 years as a society. I am Beverly Sherrod, first vice president of the society and chairman of the Parent Chapter Fellowship Committee, which is offering this evening's entertainment. The Colonial Dames began in America's Gilded Age. Rather than tell you about these enterprising women of the 1890s, we're going to let them speak for themselves through the letters, invitations, and ephemera that they've left behind. We hope their shimmering images and their sparkling words will light up the dark winter season we're entering now. Reading today are three contemporary dames. Christine Jones is a professional actress of both stage and film. She will read for Mrs. Van Rensselaer, the first secretary of the Colonial Dames, as well as for other correspondents. Dara Brown, a professional actress, is currently breaking news anchor and weekend host for MSNBC Now. Dara will read for Julia Livingston Delafield, whose history, the Colonial Dames of America, gives a detailed account of the CDA's early years. She will also read the letters of other founding members. Sally Lee, a professional actress and director, will read for Justina Livingston Atterbury, Sarah Gardner, and others. Finally, Daniel Steffens, husband and father of Colonial Dames and the son-in-law of our late verifying genealogist, Pat Faraday, will read the parts of all the men. Daniel spent six years broadcasting with National Public Radio and now works in financing global technologies. These energetic ladies of the 1890s were saluted in rhyme by Mr. Chauncey Depew, orator, railroad president, United States Senator, man of society, and admirer of all colonial dames who wrote. Here lies a poor woman who always was busy. She lived under pressure that rendered her dizzy. She belonged to 10 clubs and read Browning at night showed at luncheons and teas, and would vote if she might. She served on a school board with courage and zeal. She golfed, and she kodaked, and rode on a wheel. She read Tolstoy and Ibsen, knew microbes by name, approved of Dessart, and was a daughter and dame. Her children went in for the top education. Her husband went seaward for a nervous prostration. One day on her tablets, she found an hour free. The shock was too great, and she died instantly. From the history of Julia Delafield. The origin of the Colonial Dames was very natural and simple. In April 1890, Mrs. John King Van Rensselaer and Mrs. John Lyon Gardner were spending the day with Mrs. Archibald Gracie King at her home at Weehawken. After luncheon, when walking on the bluff near the spot where General Hamilton fell in the fatal duel, Mrs. Van Rensselaer said, let us found a patriotic society of women descended from colonial ancestry. Mrs. Van Rensselaer, while speaking, overlooked hills and valleys consecrated by the suffering of patriots. Within a radius of 20 miles was the long line of earthworks, which the plow had not yet wholly effaced. Fort Washington, Fort Lee, Harlem were familiar localities. The recollections connected with these battlegrounds, the sad retreat of our heroic army when the British entered the city, and the joyful return when the seven years of warfare had given liberty and peace, these thoughts inspired the noble resolve to keep the memories green of our colonial and revolutionary ancestors. Signed, Julia Livingston Delafield. A greeting from Mrs. Van Rensselaer. Ladies, it is my pleasant duty as a representative of the Society of Colonial Dames of America to lay before you, the representative women of Philadelphia, an account of the work your sisters in New York have been doing the past year in order to gather together the descendants of the men and women who colonized the New World, who fought for its independence, and who, by their courage, created the United States of America those heroic forefathers whose memory should be enshrined in the hearts of those to whom they have left the priceless 
inheritance of a land of freedom. Respectfully submitted, Mrs. J.K. Van Rensselaer. From the history of Julia Delacour. Strangely enough, our troubles began with our popularity. The original and picturesque name of the society seemed to inspire many women of any American ancestry with fervor and ambition. The court of personal pride was touched when the founders made one of the requisites of initiation the power to memorize an ancestor of renown in the annals of the country. From the moment that the society's name and scope became public, the doors of the secretary were besieged for admittance, and aspirants would nolans volans become colonial dames. Not very exactly as the title of the society contained no magic spell to turn back the tide of time and turn its members into veritable colonial dames. Signed, Julia Delafield. Acceptance by Mrs. Johnston. Mrs. J. Borman Johnston has much pleasure in accepting the invitation to join the Society of the Colonial Dames of America, May 8, 1891, 14 West 12th. A letter from Miss Wendell. My dear Mrs. Van Rensselaer, I received blanks to fill up and it would give me great pleasure if I could have the list of all my ancestors, but our Bibles with records are so scattered, I can only give you the list I enclose. My nephew, Bruce Wendell, is a member of the Cincinnati inherited from my oldest brother, Herman Wendell. All the Schuylers were our ancestors, the Wendells and Lansings, spelt in Dutch with an H. I hope the record is enough. I have no special pride in the matter as I have no children of my own, but my nephews and nieces might like the appointment for me, also my adopted daughters. I have always had a righteous pride in my family because they were all good men and women of the olden time. And the stories of one of my aunt Schuylers during the revolution have become a matter of history. She married an English officer and was called during the revolution, the American lady, Mrs. Grant because she entertained the officers in both armies after the revolution at her home between Troy and Albany. In the colonial history of New York, my grandfather's house in Poughkeepsie has a place, Lawrence Van Cleach. Everything on the woodwork came from Holland. My great-grandfather Wendell came from Prussia. All my other ancestors were Hollanders. A letter from Mrs. Baron. Dear Mrs. Van Rensselaer, I am sending you a formal answer to the notification of my election, which I was very pleased to get. As to the claims clasps, I will wear them or not wear them according to the custom of the dames, but I should like to wear them, being of a somewhat material turn of mind and having also a fancy for the outward and visible signs of things. Did you by any chance see an article in last week's papers with the extremely cheerful title of The Living Driven Out by the Dead? It was about Newton, Long Island, and it made the appalling statement that the dead population of that storied spot was larger than the living population of New York at the present day. <laughs> it seems that after every rainstorm, little avalanches of the skulls of the departed appear in the streets, causing hysterical symptoms to appear amongst the younger female population, who are becoming extremely timid about venturing out after dark, which is just as well, perhaps, late hours are bad for the young. It amused me in connection with the many researches which I have made on Long Island at different times, and which had finally resulted in producing the impression in my mind that most of the people there were dead. I hope to see you one of these days soon, unofficially, and will bring you a token, touching token, in the shape of the first proof of the Allsop pedigree, which Bierstadt has only just sent us after keeping the original for a most unconscionable length of time. I suppose I should not complain, but be rather pleased that it has not been burned. We lost the negative of an old portrait in Pax Fire the other day. Ah, 
My arm is still very stiff and my writing illegible, I fear. I trust, however, that you will be able to make out that I am, as always, very sincerely yours, Effie Beekman Barone. A letter from Mrs. Hare. My dear Mrs. Smith, my daughter, like most people, young people nowadays, has paled to take any interest, as I had hoped she would, in the colonial names and their work. And if she is to be married early this spring, I think it best to send in her resignation. If she should in the future, as she grows older and wiser, wish to rejoin, I do hope you will allow her to do so. Sincerely yours, Mary Meredith Hare. A letter from Mrs. Reed. My dear Mrs. Van Rensselaer, my daughter, Mrs. T.W. Ward, has just written to me that I must complete the list of 20 ladies to form the nucleus of the Maryland chapter of your admirably formed society of colonial dames. I'm also in instant receipt of a note from a Mrs. Irvin Kaiser, knee Washington, lineal descent from the parents of our first president. We have unanimously chosen her for the president of our Maryland chapter on account of her descent and her conservative qualities of supreme intelligence and prudence, breeding, sincerity, and tact. Saying that she goes to New York, I therefore write at once to ask if you will not at least call and see her before she returns to Baltimore, as she will remain in New York over Thanksgiving Day. I have been greatly hampered in selecting these 20 ladies by the Philadelphia move to start an independent society here, which was so absurdly conducted to make a ridiculous rivalry and unwelcome publicity of the subject. Pray disabuse Mrs. Kaiser of a wrong impression given to a Baltimore lady that your society rejects all descendants who have gone down in wealth or social importance that was told to me the other day. Seriously, I am, my dear Mrs. Van Rensselaer, faithfully yours, Elizabeth A. Reed. A letter from Mr. Pennington. 7 East Eager Street, Baltimore, Maryland, April 23rd, 1892. My dear Mrs. Van Rensselaer, please accept my humble apology for this informal paper, but I have an insuperable prejudice in the favor of scriptural elbow room for my pen's play. I have made special note of the points suggested in the note of your 21st. One of them, disposition of badges, seems at first glance to present as many horns as an apocalyptic beast, but I think an acceptable solution of the difficulties can be selected. I made some progress yesterday in the draft of a constitution and bylaws for the general adoption by the chapters, and shall have it completed in ample time for your meeting. In reference to chapter one, it might be well if you write to the president, notifying her of the proposed reference of the constitutional matter to your board, and suggesting that no further action be had here until further notice. Very sincerely yours, William C. Pennington. A letter from Mrs. George. My dear Mrs. Van Rensselaer, I send my papers for the Colonial Dames and hope that they are made out as they should be. I am very anxious for a clasp for my great-grandfather Stephen Lee, who was held as hostage on the prison ship Pack Horse in Charleston Harbor. I do not feel sure that he really comes under the head of what is required for a clasp, but I should especially value it because my father and my only son both bear his name. I was so sorry not to meet you when you were in Baltimore. I should so have enjoyed talking over the dames with you. I am very much interested and think we can form an agreeable chapter in Baltimore if we can start it before many who I know would prefer the dames of America have joined the Maryland Society, which held its first meeting last week. Hoping to have the pleasure of meeting you before very long, I am very sincerely yours, Amabel Lee George. A letter from Mr. Pennington. 
My dear Mrs. Van Rensselaer, it is quite a relief to me, the receipt of your note of the 8th, and I hope that you were again able to resume your place at the helm and in the mood to point to the notice. Don't speak to the man at the wheel. Having an occasion to write to our busy first V president, I availed myself of it to refer to the instructions on purple paper, forbidding by express exception, members of the board to make nominations and impressing upon her that they, as they are all, save one, officers and ex officio members of the board of chapter one. They cannot severally nominate candidates to be voted upon them by them collectively. Hence, the parent society must elect members enough to constitute a full board and some sups to play the part of nominators. I picture them as bleating lambs bound with a cord, which they could neither break nor loose, compelled to wait the liberating hand of their parent. That seems to me a very safe situation to let them rest quietly for a little while. You have only to show them that you are sharpening the knife and tell them that you are coming. Very sincerely yours, William C. Pennington. A letter from Mrs. George. My dear Mrs. Van Rensselaer, I have been so fearfully busy with a charity entertainment that I have not had a moment to answer your kind letter of Monday last. We consider this letter entirely confidential and I will try and explain our difficulties to you in hopes that you may advise and help us. We do not know at all what Mrs. Kaiser wrote in regard to our request to the board in New York to pass on the claims of our first 19 members, as neither her letter or your reply have been put before us. From your letter to me and Mrs. Ward's to Mama, we know that your board decided that they could not grant our request, and we are all sorry. The reason for our request was that Mrs. Kaiser thought it was impossible for the charter members to select others to form a board, and that we could not elect anyone or do anything until the board was formed. We feel very anxious to have the chapter established on a firm footing before we break up for the summer, and things are rather at a standstill just now. Mrs. Kaiser has been away for some days and does not seem anxious to act. What can you suggest to get the ball rolling again? The lady in Washington was decided on because the ladies consider it absolutely necessary to have an historian to verify the claims sent in and only other person suggested was a gentleman who occupies a similar position for the false games. We did not think it would be appropriate to have our papers go into the same hands as the others. So when Mrs. Fermer Lee suggested her friend, she was unanimously settled on. I feel a little uncomfortable about writing to you on this matter as Mrs. Kaiser did not think Mama should have spoken of it to Mrs. Ward. But as this is, as was my other letter, entirely unofficial. I think that if you understand exactly how matters are with us, you will be better able to advise. We all think Mama's badge is so handsome that I'm very anxious for mine. Will you send the order to Tiffany for it? I'm afraid you will think me a dreadful bore coming to you all the time for help. If, if we could only get fairly started, everything would work out all right, I am sure. Very sincerely yours, Annabel Lee George. A letter from Mr. Pennington. My dear Mrs. Van Rensselaer, please excuse my sending you an assortment of crap scrap suggestions in answer to your remarks instead of an elaborate formal brief, but you know that our thoughts come to us like the descent of the fil de la Bruges, those delicate filaments which float in the air ever on a downward course never persevering their first form, visible only in reflection of the present sunlight. You note, of course, that my forms were designed only for the chapters, and I made an effort to keep them within a fair range of the originals. If you propose to make changes in your little red book, call to mind the English wit's answer on hearing a friend say, poor X, I'm afraid is impairing his constitution. Constitution? He has used that up long ago and is now living on his bylaws. There is, in fact, a vast amount of vital energy that may be stored like bottled lightning in the bylaws of a society. The alterations of your constitution need be a very few and of minor importance. 
the flesh and bone and feathering of the bird's body are comparatively of small account. The strength and sweep of the wings sustain it in its flight. Take time enough, months of it, all summer, to think over amendments and make the rod of power so highly charged that if any rude hand attempt to lay hold of it, let it first lesson, let the first lesson be Second Samuel chapter six, verses six, etc. In every combined effort for good as well as evil, we must meet one class that will rule or ruin, and we must deal with them by extracting that fang and relegate them to the lower form of rule or ruin. You see, my response mill is like that of the gods, so you must keep the supply of grist. You're very sincerely yours, William C. Pennington. A letter from Mrs. Phillips. Dear Mrs. Van Rensselaer, I enclose a hasty little note which I received some days ago from Miss Justina Livingston Atterbury of Trenton, of whom you probably know through her New York relations, for I think you can answer it more intelligently and with more authority than I. You see, she does not understand about the original society, for she calls it the New York branch. I believe there is as yet no New Jersey chapter, but I do not feel sufficiently posted upon the subject to write anything of a positive nature, and I have not sent her a copy of the Constitution and bylaws, as I do not feel authorized to do so. I was much disappointed that I was prevented from going on to New York to the service upon Washington's birthday, but I hope there will be some meeting of the dames this spring to which I can run in. With cordial regards and hoping to hear that I am doing right in troubling you with this matter, believe me, dear Mrs. Van Rensselaer, very sincerely, Ellen Emlem Phillips. The letter from Miss Justina Atterbury. Dear Nelly, the ladies here are about starting a New Jersey branch of Colonial Dames. They are anxious to see a copy of bylaws of the New York branch. And also, can you send me any of the officers' names? I think John said you belong to the New York branch. And if so, would you lend us a copy of the bylaws? I will see that it is returned in safety. Please excuse this hurried note, my dear, but my head is aching today. With much love, affectionately, Miss Justina Atterbury, Trenton, New Jersey. Or Miss Justina L. Atterbury. My dear madam, Mrs. K. Van Rensselaer sent me your letter of March 3rd. In response, I would say that the colonial dames of America are grateful to think that the ladies of Trenton wish to join their association. Under the laws of the society, it is necessary to be proposed by two or more members. After several members from one locality have joined the society, it is then in order to form a chapter. A number of ladies living in various localities in New Jersey who are honored members of our society are thinking of forming a chapter. Your proposal to do so without being a member is an infringement of their rights. And this proposal to take our name a discourtesy, which however, I presume you do not attend. You are mistaken in calling us the New York branch. We are the original and only society and all persons assuming the name of colonial dames who do not belong to our society are acting in an unladylike manner to us. If you and your friends will send us your names and the heroic ancestors from whom you are descended to us and fill out our forms and subscribe to our rules, it will then be in order to form a chapter, which may be a Trenton one if you wish. Our principal aim is to have an organized pedigree that is regulated for future generations. Yours truly, Mrs. J.K. Van Rensselaer. To Mrs. J.K. Van Rensselaer, dear madam, yours of March 9th is at hand. I hasten to answer, to thank you for your reply to my letter of inquiry to my cousin, Mrs. K. Van Rensselaer. <sighs> There's evidently been some mistake and not being of one of the principal movers, I have sent your letter to headquarters. I do most sincerely trust 
you will not think for a moment that any infringement has been intended or discourtesy or unladylike treatment meant. Uh, can you tell me if the Pennsylvania Society of the Colonial Dames of America is an authorized body? I feel very much interested in the Colonial Dames and I'm anxious to enroll my name amongst them. Thanking again and hoping this may explain, I am yours truly, Justina Livingston Atterbury. To Mrs. J.K. Ben Rensselaer. From Mrs. J.K. Ben Rensselaer. Yours of March 11 has been received. And in reply, I would state that there must be some mistake with regard to the proposed organization you wrote about. The society is one that we, the original society, do not recognize in any way. It is composed of women who deliberately formed an association out of hand and took the name that in no way describes them in order that they might be mistaken for our society, which been a, had been organized a year and a half before theirs. Many of their conditions of eligibility are not like ours. We, we are very conservative and move with great deliberation and may not be able to organize any chapter this spring. I have pointed out to you in my first letter the steps to be taken if you wish to join us and should you get Mrs. K. Ben Rensselaer to propose you, all the necessary papers will be sent to you through her. I am yours truly, Mrs. J. K. Ben Rensselaer. Secretary. A letter from Mrs. Nichols. Dear Mary, last evening Mrs. Gion, an entire stranger to me, asked me various questions about the colonial dames and finding me, I suppose, rather non-committal, expressed her intention of writing to the president of the society for further information. I believe that the particular question was whether membership in another society of similar purpose excluded all chance of favorable consideration. I did not see how I could possibly decline to give her your address, but the recollection of that interview has annoyed me all day as I know that you have quite enough to do without the trouble of answering endless applications. Pray believe me that I would have saved you with the bother if simple absence of encouragement on my part had produced any effect upon my visitor who had by mere chance heard that I belonged to the CDA. Yesterday, I was agreeably surprised by a most interesting letter from your mother giving an account of the meeting that I'd missed and of various resignations. I hope the members of the newly organized society will find harmony and concord attainable, but I doubt it. The meeting must have been much more agreeable without such an expenditure of legal talent and eloquence as we had last year. I shall write as soon as possible to thank your mother for her letter, but I felt that I wanted you first to understand that I had not suggested that any applications should be made to you. I have just written a regret and a very sincerely regret meant too to Mrs. Gardiner in answer to her invitation to luncheon to meet Mrs. R. Gracie King. Affectionately yours, O.R. Nichols. From the history of Julia Delafield. We had no boardroom for several years. Our charts, books, etc., were kept by the secretary, Mrs. J. K. Van Rensselaer. All official business was transacted at her house. The generous hospitality of Mrs. Van Rensselaer can never be forgotten. A small room was hired at 156 Fifth Avenue in January, 1896, and a larger one in February, 1897. We moved to our present quarters at 109 University Place, June 1, 1899. Our room was furnished by liberal gifts. Our walls are adorned with rare engravings and etchings. We had the courage to invite the dames to tea when we were installed in our first small apartment. Someone said that our courage was great. 
for we had little to show and only six chairs to sit upon. Signed, Julia Delafield. Telegram to Mrs. Van Rensselaer. Dear Madam, at a meeting of the Board of Managers held today, February 5th, 1896, at 156 Fifth Avenue at room 1012, a motion was made by Mrs. Gardner, seconded by Mrs. O, that the secretary be requested to acknowledge the receipt of the three pedigree books delivered to the board by Mrs. A.J. King and also express their appreciation of Mrs. Van Rensselaer's able and intelligent care of these valuable records as well as the great time expended upon them. And to ask Mrs. Van Rensselaer in whose possession the book plate now is. Telegram to Mrs. John King Van Rensselaer, care of Archibald Gracie King, Highwood Bluff, Wee Hawken. <sighs> Rush, the President and Board of Managers Society, Colonial Dames of America, ask Mrs. Van Rensselaer where to find the minutes of the annual election of April 1895. They are not in the book of minutes and have been searched for elsewhere in vain and are indispensable for the annual election meeting tomorrow, Thursday. Mary Hockman Johnson. From the history of Julia Delafield. Two years after they were first organized, the Colonial Dames returned to Highwood Bluff, the site on which Mrs. Van Rensselaer had suggested the idea of the society. They met to commemorate the death of Alexander Hamilton at the hand of Aaron Burr. Signed, Julia Delafield. A letter from Mr. Pennington. My dear Mrs. Van Rensselaer, with the earnest desire to promote the purposes of the meeting of the, of the society at Highwood Bluff on the 28th, which Mrs. Pennington and I regret our inability to attend, she requests me to enclose to you two interesting letters addressed to her grandfather, General Robert Goodloe Harper. One of them, dated in 1803, is from Aaron Burr, which I will not mar by anticipating its contents. The other, of 1804, by Alexander Hamilton, containing expressions of political distrust of Burr, the repetition of which became, a few months later, the inducement to their deplorable meeting in, at Highwood. The reading of them on the spot would, I think, excite emotions of varied nature. I commend them to your careful treatment and beg that you will return them at your convenience. Please do not allow the newspaper fellows to get hold of their contents. It will give me pleasure to send you copies of them if you care to have them. I also enclose some specimens of the money of our fathers, Maryland currency of 1775 and 1776, which we present to the society. They may be classed as tradition, for into that category, these promises to pay have been long, long transferred. Hoping that the meeting will re redeem its promise of a perfect success with our cordial recommendation, commendation to the more fortunate in their attendance and renewed regret for enforced absence, I remain very sincerely yours, William C. Pennington. Pennington. A letter from Mrs. Mason. Dear Mrs. Van Rensselaer, I regret exceedingly that I will be unable to be present at the meeting of the Colonial Dames at Highwood Bluff on April 18th. It would be a great pleasure to me to visit that historical estate so intimately connect connected with the events of the revolutionary era. It is very difficult for me to get away from home at any time, owing to my frequent attacks of my old enemy, neuralgia. I am never sure of myself, unable to make any plans for excursions. Such being the case, it seems to me that I had better resigned my membership in the society, as I cannot take part in its meetings or join in its festivities. I trust you will understand my position and that you and the rest of the Colonial Dames will have a delightful day on the heights of Weehawken. Very sincerely, the Cab Bory Mason. A letter from Mr. Pennington. 
Dear Mrs. Van Rensler, I thank you most cordially for your note, which, with the two letters, was received late last evening. It is a lively satisfaction to Mrs. Pennington and myself to learn that our efforts to contribute to the pleasure and interest of the Highwood Bluff meeting were successful. It was on occasion behind whose head no single lock of hair rewards the hand that fair would grasp it there. I intend to forward to you copies of the Hamilton and Burr letters, which you will be free to use as you deem proper. Of the old currency, I have a bundle, over 12 inches high, representing depth into which some worthy patriot plunged his foot in an ecstasy of confidence in the infant state's vitality and solvency. If you or any of your friends would care to have some specimens, it will afford me great pleasure to send them to you. In all sincere respect, faithfully yours, William C. Pennington. The History of Julia Delafield. The dames were very sociable in the early years of the society. We met very frequently at luncheons and teas. At every meeting, original essays or copies of old letters were read. The first evening party was given by Mrs. John Lyon Gardner, December 6th, 1891. The invitations were written on the backs of playing cards and the dames wore colonial costumes. It was very brilliant and the success of the first assembly of the Colonial Dames of America induced several ladies to apply for admission into the society. The board has never failed, either as individuals or in their collective capacity to entertain members of our chapters when they visited this city. The annual meeting each April is preceded by a luncheon at Sherry's, Delmonico's, or at the house of a dame and followed by afternoon tea. Signed, Julia Delafield. A letter from Miss Sarah Gardner. My dear Mary, your last delightful letter has reached me and I need not tell you how welcome it is I'm thinking of you now in Greece. That seems very far away. Nevertheless, I feel sure that you keep a warm place in your heart for our society. So we'll proceed at once with a short description of the luncheon given at the ladies annex at the Metropolitan Club. It was a great success and I regretted your absence knowing how much you would have enjoyed it. A number of out-of-town members were present, and some young girls, daughters of dames, were especially invited. They helped very much to en enliven the entertainment, but unfortunately the weather was wet, and consequently the beautiful toilettes appeared less to less advantage. The annual meeting took place first, and was followed by the luncheon, which was well served with an attractive menu of appetizing and daintily prepared dishes. Mrs. Van Rensselaer deserves great credit for having arranged every detail with such care. Every New York member was given a card on which was inscribed the name of the guest she was to take in. My aunt and my cousin, Sarah Lane, with three other ladies, sat with me. Infinite pains had been taken by Mrs. Van Rensselaer to place the right people together in order to make a congenial party at each table. And as she moved about the rooms, she filled her office to perfection and looked remarkably well, her dove-colored toque being most becoming. Miss Delafield has invited the dames to meet at her house in Darien, on May 13th, and Mrs. Prime of Albany has also issued invitations. But both these entertainments I shall miss, much to my regret, as we sail for England on the 8th. Excellent cabins have been secured for us on the Teutonic, and although not having made very definite plans, we hope this time to see something of Scotland and Holland, never having visited those countries I trust we may see you in Europe. Affectionately yours, Sarah Gardiner. May, 1895. Mrs. John V. L. Prime requests the pleasure of your company on Tuesday, May 14th, 1895, 13 Elk Street, Albany, New York. K. 
Carriages will meet the Empire State Express on arrival at 11.15 a.m. and also take guests to the New York Express at 5 p.m. From the History of Julia Delafield. Mrs. Prime entertained her guests on May 14th with a luncheon, then took them to the state capitol, where they were cordially welcomed by the governor. In November of that year, 1895, the Colonial Dames held a revel in Madison Square Concert Hall for the benefit of the Fort Cralo Preservation Fund. Although not a financial success, the historic tableau featuring members of the society were very beautiful and received enthusiastic praise. The tableau were arranged chronologically to show the advance of civilization on our western shores. First, the Aboriginal Indian. Next, the European colonist. Then, the American freemen. The characters in these tableaux were portrayed by 73 of their lineal descendants. The revel did attract the notice of the wider public, including this proposition from the firm of John McClave and Sons, manufacturers of the Colonial Bicycle. Signed, Julia Delafield. A letter from Mr. McClave. Mrs. J.K. Van Rensler, 40 East 29th Street, City. Dear Madam, learning that the Society of the Colonial Dames intend giving an entertainment at Madison Square Concert Hall this month, we felt that being the manufacturers of a ladies' bicycle called the Colonial Dame, that it would be not in that it would be that it would not be improper for us to ask the society if they would allow us to stand our machine somewhere in the hall upon the nights of the entertainments where it could be seen and for everyone if sold through the influences of your society we would allow twenty five dollars on each cycle which amount it seems to us would be a quite a little help to the fund the colonial bicycle is a strictly high grade machine and sells for $100, and in closing, we have to say that if the above proposition does not meet with your approval, possibly you could suggest a better and greatly oblige. Very truly yours, John McClave and Sons. A letter from Mrs. Van Rensler. Dear sirs, in answer to yours from November 1st, I would say that our society have no objection to your sending an agent with a bicycle to the entertainment to be given November 21st on the conditions proposed in your letter that you would allow $25 on each us, $25 on each bicycle sold. The arrangements for selling the machine must be entirely on your own responsibility. Very truly yours, Mrs. J.K. Ben Rensselaer. Secretary. Dame Martha Bayard Stevens asked the honor of your company on Tuesday afternoon, December the 8th at four o'clock to partake of a dish of tea and hear a short history of the colonial dames whose portraits adorn her walls. A letter from Mrs. Robinson. My dear Mrs. Schmidt, I was very sorry to find Miss Stevens away when I called yesterday, all the more so that a southern trip so often means the need of a change of air to recover from a normal state of health. Since I last saw you, I, I, I myself, and you told me she was ill, I myself have had tonsillitis, grip, malaria, etc., and have been south and only at Lakewood, or I would not have left it until yesterday to inquire about Miss Stevens. I am now writing to try and interest you, if possible, in a thought concerning the CDA that has come to me. Our badges read, May 23rd, 1890. Do you not think it would be a good idea to have an entertainment of some sort on May 23rd to celebrate our 10th anniversary? It might be carried out in one of various ways when it was once taken hold of. Perhaps the most feasible would be for one of the prominent members to give a fetch, either in the country, as it will be the latter part of May, or in the city. To have it distinctive, it might be treated as a 10th anniversary 
in a tin wedding and the invitations could either be stamped on thin sheets of tin foil with May 23rd, 1890 and May 23rd, 1900 in the opposite corners. Or what would be more effective, the invitation could be edged with tin after the fashion of the little tin type I am enclosing and which you could show to the board or any hospital a hospitally kind member as a suggestion could help with. If we decided to do anything to help towards a patriotic cause by having some of the younger members pose in tableau at the Waldorf Astoria and charging for the tickets, we could probably arrange something else in the shape of some magic lantern slides to be thrown on a sheet which could be used as a curtain with more cartoons pictured there, which would prevent the waits in between from being tedious. But while that might be made a success, it would involve some expenditure. And between the publication fund, lawyer's fees, getting out the certificates, etc., the society may be tired of the idea of contributing to anything. Mrs. Boudinet, to whom I have spoken, seems to think it would be a very good thing <laughs> And if after the board meeting, you could tell me what lines you think it would be best to work upon, I have no doubt it would meet with the hearty cooperation of all who could help it along. Hoping you are well in this season of grips and coals, almost always sincerely yours, Harriet D. Robinson. It was the end of our first decade. We don't know how the Danes celebrated their 10th and 10th anniversary, whether one of the more prominent members gave a fete, or whether the younger members ever arranged themselves in picturesque tableaus. One day we may find answers somewhere in a box in someone's attic. History is built from these scraps of memory. Woven together, they bring a vanished world back into the light. This is the mission of the Colonial Dames of America. So before I turn this over to our President General, Brantley Knowles, all of us who have been reading would like to wish you a Merry Christmas, a Happy Hanukkah, and a joyous, healthy New Year. Mm -hmm.